We gather to worship this morning in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. This time we invited Neil sit or stand for a time of silent reflection on God's word and for self-examination. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I invite you to stand for the reading of the Psalm of the Day, which comes from Psalm chapter 136. We join together. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of gods, for his steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of lords, for his steadfast love endures forever. To him who alone does great wonders, for his steadfast love endures forever. To him who by understanding made the heavens, for his steadfast love endures forever. To him who spread out the earth above the waters, for his steadfast love endures forever. To him who made the great lights, for his steadfast love endures forever. The sun to rule over the day, for his steadfast love endures forever. The moon and stars to rule over the night, for his steadfast love endures forever. We join together in singing the first two verses of hymn number 783. be with you. Let us pray. Almighty and most merciful God, the protector of all who trust in you, strengthen our faith and give us courage to believe that in your love you will rescue us from all adversities. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, 
who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated for the scripture reading. The Old Testament reading is taken from Genesis chapter 9, verses 8 through 17, and may be found in your pew Bible on page 7. God said to Noah and to his sons with him, Behold, I establish my covenant with you and your offspring after you, and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the livestock, and every beast of the earth with you, as many as came out of the ark. It is for every beast of the earth. I establish my covenant with you, that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood, and never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, This is the sign of the covenant that I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. I have set my bow in the clouds, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth when I bring clouds over the earth and the bow is seen in the clouds. I will remember my covenant that is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And the waters shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the bow is in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant that I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. This is the word of the Lord. The epistle reading is from Ephesians chapter three, verses 14 to 21 in your pew Bible on page 977. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Lord, for from, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Gospel according to St. Mark, the sixth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, to Bethsaida, while he dismissed the crowd. And after he had taken leave of them, he went up on the mountain to pray. And when evening came, the boat was out on the sea, and he was alone on the land. And he saw that they were making headway painfully for the wind was against them. And about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them, walking on the sea. He meant to pass by them, but when they saw him walking on the sea, they thought it was a ghost and cried out, for they all saw him and were terrified. But immediately he spoke to them and said, take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. And he got into the boat with them, and the wind ceased, and they were utterly astounded. For they did not understand about the loaves, but their hearts were hardened. When they had crossed over, they came to land at Gennesaret and moored up to the shore. And when they got out of the boat, the people immediately recognized him 
and ran about the whole region and began to bring the sick people on their beds to wherever they heard he was. And wherever he came, in villages, cities, or countryside, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and implored them that they might touch even the fringe of his garment. And as many as touched it were made well. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. May we see as we join together in singing hymn number 575. you to open a Bible to Ephesians chapter 3. You can follow along with the reading in the bulletin, Ephesians chapter 3, and we should prepare our hearts and minds to receive God's word and the good news of Jesus this morning. We go to our God in prayer. Our first prayer is for our own hearts and minds that the Holy Spirit would make them still give us a peace that goes beyond all understanding and reminds us and comforts us with the holy gospel this morning. Our second prayer is for our brothers and sisters in Christ that the Holy Spirit would uplift and encourage them with the hearing of God's word and the gospel of Jesus. And finally, I ask that you pray for me that I would preach faithfully and truthfully the word of God for all to hear and the gospel of Jesus for all to hear. Psalm 19 says, may the words of my mouth and meditation of my heart be acceptable and pleasing to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. So Ephesians chapter 3, this section of Paul's letter to the church in Ephesus is a prayer. And it teaches us not just what to pray, but how to pray for one another, how to pray for ourselves, and why we should be praying. And prayer is one of those topics that every Christian knows about and hears about, but sometimes we forget to do. Anybody ever forgotten to pray before? Right? 
Um, my family grew up saying, come Lord Jesus. Anybody familiar with that prayer? All right, even when you guys, as your pastor, you pressure me at potlucks to pastor, we can't eat till you get downstairs and pray. And guess what I pray? Come Lord Jesus, because you guys, you guys can pray without me. Just letting you know, it's, it's, it's something you could do, all right? But my family did this so often, we got into the habit of praying before every meal, that sometimes we would forget halfway through the meal, and someone would ask, did we pray? And no one could remember. So we would pray again halfway through the meal, just to make sure, what? We didn't forget. We're like, okay, we got our bases covered. In case we did it, we did it twice, and that's okay. Praise the Lord. All right, but halfway through, we're like, well, we do we pray, right? So there are little prayers like that, prayers before meals and prayers before bedtime that my mom and my dad taught my brother and I to pray out of routine and rhythm. But then there's also the serious types of prayers that we can forget. Anybody have ever had to make a major decision or try to do something on your own without praying first? And then it falls apart, so you pray later, because you're like, God, please bail me out of my terrible choices, amen. All right, anybody have done that prayer? I've done that prayer a lot, where I'm like, I've got, I've got wisdom, I've got clarity, I've talked to friends, and then you charge straight ahead into your plan, and it falls apart, and the Lord's like, you're going to ask me and talk to me about it now? And you're like, yes, I am. All right, let's pray. All right, so we know that prayer is important, right? Almost every Christian would agree prayer is an important part of our spiritual life and our relationship with Jesus. When I meet with people, oftentimes one of the things people want to grow in or learn more about is prayer. We know it's important because in the Gospels, we get the Lord's Prayer, and we get the Lord's because the apostles looked at Jesus and said, we need you to teach us how to pray. So Paul, in this section of Ephesians, is teaching us two things. He's teaching us how to pray, and he's teaching us why to pray. So the first thing I want to do is just comfort you that if you're like, I, I'm not sure how to pray. I'm not an expert in prayer. I'm not a prayer warrior. I haven't got it all figured out. You're in good company because even the apostles, after years of being with Jesus and doing all kinds of miracles, looked at him and said, we need you to teach us how to do what? Pray. You know, the thing in the Gospels is they never ask him, teach us how to do a miracle. They never ask him, teach us how to cast out a demon. And those are the things that they did. The only thing they ever ask him to teach us is, teach us how to pray. So the first thing I want to do is just encourage you this morning. If, if you're like, I'm new to prayer, I'm not great at prayer, I struggle with it, I, sometimes I'm really good at it, other times I'm really bad at it and faithful with it, it's okay. You're in good company. You're in the company of the apostles and the disciples that have gone before you. And Paul knew this, so this is why when he writes to the church in Ephesus, he's telling them, this is how I pray and what I pray for to give them an example. So let's go into verse 14. Paul says, for this reason, I bow my knees before the Father. Now, this does not mean... Be careful here, right? The, the bow my knees before the Father. Obviously, Paul is talking about prayer. This does not mean you have to kneel every time you pray. All right, I've been asked this before of, Pastor, do I have to fold my hands, close my eyes, and bow my head every time I pray? I could survey you, and I'd probably get an interesting response. Um, some of you might think, well, yeah, of course you do, because that's how you pray. <laughs> All right, here's the answer according to the Bible. No, you don't actually, okay? You can just sit there and pray and be still. The reason when you were a little kid, and I worked in a daycare, and I helped Miss Donna teach Jesus to the little kids in the preschool, and we pray every Monday when we do our Bible stories. The reason Miss Donna and I tell the kids it's time to fold your hands, close your eyes, and bow your heads is to keep them still during the prayer. It's not actually holiness to God, okay? Is it wrong to fold your hands and bow your head and close your eyes? No, you can pray that way. When Paul says, I bow my knees, he's actually making a distinction. And many scholars have pointed out this cultural distinction that Paul is making. In a Jewish culture, the typical way for a man to pray was standing up with his hands raised to heaven. We see this with the stories in the gospel that Jesus tells about the Pharisee and how he prays. We see Jesus talk about this, of when you pray, you can pray privately. You don't have to do it in a big public thing. In fact, when Paul writes a letter to Timothy, he says, I actually want all the men in the church to pray with their hands raised to heaven. Okay? So Paul is talking about a distinction. And scholars have pointed out that 
when Gentiles went to pagan temples, the way they often prayed was by kneeling down and bowing down, okay? So when Paul is writing this letter to Ephesians earlier in chapter 3, he says, I'm writing to you Gentiles. So what he's saying is he's saying, it doesn't matter if you pray standing up with your hands raised. Now we're Lutheran, so if you do this in church, we love you. I'm just letting you know someone might stare because, you know, we're Lutheran. And how many of you do this? How many of you want to do this with me right now? Anybody want to come up here and do it? All right. <laughs> All right. If you pray like this, Paul is saying, guess what? That is also okay and welcomed by God. The point that Paul is making when he says, I kneel before the Father, he's saying, the Father that we pray to is the Father for everybody whether they are Jew or Gentile, whether you pray with your hands folded and your eyes closed and your head bowed, you pray kneeling or you pray standing or you pray with your hands raised to heaven, Paul's saying it is the same Father that we are all praying to. And this is really good news because one of the key things to grow in our faith and in our prayer life is to understand who am I praying to? And Paul is saying, you are praying to the God who is the father of all and welcomes and loves all of his children. So we might not have the division of Jew and Gentile like Paul was dealing with in the early church, but we do often have the division, unfortunately, because of our pride, because of Satan tempts us, because of our sinful nature of holier than thou. Anybody have heard that expression, right? I'm better than this person, so I'm closer to God than they are. And so sometimes people think they are holier than other people, they are closer to God, so they think, obviously God hears my prayers. And then there are other people that are like the prodigal son. They've been so beat up by this world, by sin, by their own decisions, by things that have happened to them, that they think what? God is not for me. I can't come close to God. If you read the story of the prodigal son, he doesn't think he can come back home. And Paul, with this little statement that says, I bow my knees to the Father, is saying, no, I'm praying, and the church is praying to the God who is the Father of all people. So whether you are Jew or Gentile, God is for you, is what Paul is saying. Whether you are a saint or a sinner, God is for you. He is the father of all. Whether you have your whole life together or you feel like the prodigal son, Paul is saying, God is going to hear your prayers. He is the father of all. Whether you go to church and you're super religious and super spiritual and you don't sin or you're a great sinner in need of God's grace, Paul is saying, God is the father for both of you. So this is so important though because your view of God dramatically impacts your prayer life. If I view God as angry, judgmental, forgetful, uninterested, unloving, unkind, guess what I'm never gonna do, or rarely do? Pray, because why would I go to him? He's not gonna help me. But if I know what the Bible says, and I know that the Bible says he is the God who is father of all, including you, no matter your circumstances, your life situation, that he's the father who loves all of his children. Guess what that's going to do to your prayer life? It's going to increase it dramatically because you're going to want to what? I'm going to go to my father for all my needs. And in fact, when Jesus talks about prayer in the Gospels to his disciples, both in the Sermon on the Mount and in the Lord's Prayer, he reminds them, your father already knows all that you need. And so the way Jesus and Paul define the God who we pray to is a loving father who cares for all of his children. So once Paul establishes that foundation, then he gets into his prayer request for the church. And you got to remember, Paul is praying for the church, so he's setting us an example of how should I pray for others and how should I pray for myself. So verse 15 says, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. So again, reminding us that God is the Father of all. And then verse 16, according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being. So the first prayer request of Paul is that he wants you to be strengthened by the Spirit. 
And why do we need to be praying that and and be encouraged in that and pray for us to be and others to be strengthened in the spirit? Because life is hard. Anybody ever just need a nap? Right? I love naps. I can nap anywhere, anytime. It is my greatest spiritual gift that the Lord gave me. My wife is incredibly angry and jealous and envious of this because she can't nap unless she's sick. But boy, you let me after church go home, I'm out. Do not call me after church. I, I am taking a power nap, okay? And I can nap for hours. It is glorious. But this is what life is like. We get tired, we get worn out, and sometimes, yeah, you just need a nap, all right? And sometimes you're sick and you need a rest. But what Paul is talking about, he wants you to be empowered and strengthened by the Spirit because sometimes our souls are tired. Sometimes our spirit is worn out. You see this in the life of Jesus when he is tempted by Satan and attacked by Satan. What happens to him? He gets tired. He gets worn out. So Satan knows that, well, even Jesus was tempted in this way. The book of Hebrews says Jesus was tempted in way, every way we are except for being without sin. So of course, guess what's going to happen to you and me as followers of Jesus? We're going to get worn out. We're going to get beat up by Satan in this life, in this world, and the sin and all the badness that is in it. It's heavy sometimes. Right? And sometimes the Bible talks about life being made up of seasons. And some seasons are really great and prosperous and fruitful and amazing, right? We call them mountaintop experiences. And other times, seasons feel like the shadow of the valley of death from Psalm 23, right? And those seasons can go on for a long, long time. And we get worn out and we get exhausted. So Paul says, I know this happens to you as Christians, right? There's this false idea out there that a Christian always has to have it together. That you always got to be brave. You always just got to trust God. You always got to be strong in your faith and don't be a quitter and don't give up. And all these platitudes that we have. And the reality of life and the Christian life is included in that. If you look at the scriptures and look at the life of Jesus, the life of the apostles that we have, is life is really hard and it beats you up sometimes. And you get worn out and you get exhausted and you get tired and there's strength that you need that you don't have on your own. And that's what Paul's praying for. I want you to be strengthened by the power of the Spirit because there's going to be days or weeks or moments or circumstances where you can't do it on your own. And you're going to get to the end of yourself and you're going to be worn out and exhausted. And Paul's saying, here's your hope in those moments that you would be strengthened by the power of the Spirit, that God himself would strengthen you and encourage you. One of my favorite prayers, it's the prayer that brought me to faith, is from 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9, where Paul has been praying over and over and over again about his weakness and a thorn in his flesh and asking God to get rid of it because it's worn out. How many of you have ever asked God to take something away from you? I know we often pray for God to give us stuff, but what Paul's talking about with our need to be strengthened is sometimes there's points in the life where we need God would you just please take this difficulty away? Because I'm tired of carrying it. I'm tired of the burden. And Paul is told no three different times in that prayer in 1 Corinthians 12. And at the end of it, God reveals to him through Jesus. He says, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in your weakness. So when Paul writes this letter to the Ephesians, He's also writing from prison. He's writing out of difficult circumstances. He's not someone sitting on a mountaintop experience going, don't worry, you'll get through it. It's not that big of a deal. No, Paul's writing from prison. He's writing with a thorn in his flesh that won't be taken away. And he says, here's the only strength and the only hope that you and I have. This is what I'm praying for you as fellow believers, that you would be strengthened by the Spirit of God, that you would be strengthened by His grace, because there are moments and a lot of times in life where that's the only strength you and I have to keep going. When I was on Vicarage, I had to do pastoral counseling. You get to do a lot of things as a pastor. You get to do a lot of things as a vicar because they want you to get to experience all that it is to be a pastor to figure out, is this really what God's calling me to do? And the first counseling session I ever had was with an 80-year-old widow whose husband had just taken his own life. And I had no class on that at seminary. 
I had no preparation. I remember sitting at our dining room table with lots of tears and lots of anger and lots of frustration. I remember talking to her and praying with her and encouraging her. And the only thing that kept her going was the grace of Jesus. She said she knew that her husband was loved by Jesus and that she was still loved by Jesus. And friends, this is what Paul is talking about. He's writing from prison. He's writing with a thorn in flesh. He knows what it's like to be weak. So the first thing he's saying is it's okay to be weak. It's okay to not be strong enough and to need God's grace, to need to be strengthened by his spirit. Because one of the lies we often believe is that you should be able to do it on your own. And that's a lie from the devil. Christianity is not a solo endeavor. You do it by the power of the Holy Spirit and the grace of Jesus along with your brothers and sisters in Christ. Any of you ever heard the expression, God will never give you more than you can handle? How many of you have found out that that's a lie through your personal experience or the experience of people you deeply love, right? First of all, it's not in the Bible at all. The Bible verse says, God will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear, but he will give you a way of escape. And the thing is, and you all know I love to say this, when Paul writes the word you there, it's plural. So he said, all y'all. He's saying it's the church together. He won't give you more than you can handle or be tempted with when you are together with your brothers and sisters. Because sometimes, guess what? On your own, you are going to be too weak. You're going to be worn out. You're going to be frustrated. You're going to be exhausted. You're going to be at the end of yourself. And so Paul is praying for you. And he's praying for the church saying, you're going to need the strength of the Spirit. And one of the ways you and I get the strength of the Spirit is by praying for one another, being in each other's lives, uplifting and encouraging one another with the grace and the love of Jesus. So the first thing that Paul prays for is that we would be strengthened. He acknowledges sometimes we're going to be weak. We can't do it on our own. We need the grace of Jesus in our lives. And we need each other as brothers and sisters in Christ. Verse 17, he gives us his next prayer request. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend all with the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. We're going to get to those verses in a second. Verse 17, he says that Christ may dwell in your hearts. How many of you like the name Emmanuel when Christmas time comes around? Right? It's a beautiful promise, which is why so many people love it. I've done surveys at other churches I've been at of what's your favorite name for God, and Emmanuel almost always wins. Comes out on top with like 90% of the answers. Why? Because it's such a beautiful promise, right? It's a promise that through Jesus, God is what? He is with us. So in our joys, where is Jesus? He's with us. In our sorrows and our tears, where is Jesus? He is with us. So when we think about the word dwell, I want you to think about the name Emmanuel. He's saying, I want Jesus to dwell in your hearts, meaning I want you to know that Jesus is with you wherever you go. Now, it's more powerful than that. It's not just, oh, he's on the side or yeah, he's kind of off in the distance, like he's in the background of the selfie that I took, right? No, it's not that. It is that Jesus is dwelling with you. The Greek word for dwell means to take up permanent residence. So Paul's prayer request for you is this. I want Jesus to take up permanent residence in your heart so that no matter what you are going through, no matter what you are facing in life, you would know Jesus is with me. And that's not just a nice idea or a comforting note or a comforting message. It is the reality of the Christian life that Jesus takes up permanent residence in your heart. Which, guess what? It doesn't matter where you go, whether you're in church or not, whether you're at work or at home or on vacation or in the hospital or facing difficulties or on the highest of highs, it doesn't matter. Paul is saying, this is my prayer for you, that you would realize that Jesus is with you in every day, in every circumstance that you go through and you face. The other way to think about it is this. Jesus is not going to abandon you. He's taken up permanent residence. 
which is his way of keeping the promise that God makes throughout the scriptures when God tells his people Israel, I will never leave you or forsake you. Through Jesus, that promise is true for you. And here's the reality of prayer life. Prayer life ebbs and flows, right? One of the things that happens, it ebbs and flows because sometimes we think, is God really there? Is he really listening? Is he paying attention? Right? And the devil loves to creep in in those moments to get you to doubt the goodness of Jesus and the goodness of God. And Paul says, I want you to remember this, that Jesus has taken up permanent residence in your heart, which means he's always with you and he's never going to abandon you. He's never going to forsake you no matter what you're facing. So we can be encouraged in our prayer life knowing I can always go to him. I can always trust him. I can always believe that he is there with me. And in verse 18, that you may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. So his prayer request in general is, I want you to know how much Jesus loves you. Right? How many of you know that Jesus loves you? And how many of you, let's be honest, you don't have to raise your hand, you sometimes forget just how much he loves you. Right? You can be like, oh, I still think he loves me. I just don't know if he loves me perfectly today. Or I don't know if he's listening. I don't know if he's caring or whatever it might be. Right? Satan loves to beat us up. The world loves to beat us up and to get us to doubt what? The truth of God's promises that says Jesus loves you and it comes a measuring contest. Of, well, just how much? How much does Jesus love me? Does he love me as much as them or him or her or that person or this person? How much does Jesus love me? And Paul's answer is, here's what I want you to know. And the interesting thing is that this is in the middle of his prayer, which is also in the middle of this letter. So it is the central focus of the Paul's entire letter of Ephesians is that he wants the church to know this fundamental truth that Jesus loves you. And he says, if you want to measure it, he even says, I want you to measure it. I want you to know the breadth and the length and the height and the depth of how much the surpassing love of Jesus is for you. So early church fathers like Origen and Augustine said what Paul is talking about is the measurements of the cross. Right? The height and the depth, the breadth and the length. So if you drew that out on a piece of paper in those four directions, what do you get? A cross, which is why the early church father says, this is what Paul is praying for, and this is what Paul is pointing out, is that if you want to know how much does Jesus love me, his answer is you go to the cross, good Lutherans. You look to the cross and you go, there is your answer. How much does Jesus love me? He died on the cross to forgive my sins, past, present, and future. He died on the cross to love me with what First John calls a perfect love, and the perfect word in Greek and Hebrew means lacking nothing. It is full. It is complete. So there is not something you need to do to make Jesus love you more. He already loves you perfectly right now sitting in the pew. There is not a single thing you could possibly do to make him love you more than he already loves you. Because he has loved you with a perfect love on the cross. Paul says, that's what I want you to know as the church. Every single day, the measurement of God's love for you is the cross of Jesus. The other way of thinking about it is this. God will never love you less. So for all of you good people that want to prove to God you deserve his love because you're a goody-goody and you're a super Christian, I want you to remi be reminded there's nothing you can do to make him love you more. He's already loved you with a perfect love. And for those of you struggling with the prodigal son, struggling with shame and guilt and sins. There's nothing you can do to make him love you less because he's already loved you with a perfect love on the cross. And Paul's heart of his prayer, the heart of his message in Ephesians is, I want you as Christians to know this. I want you to comprehend it. How much does Jesus love me? When Satan comes along and he attacks you because that's what the Bible says he's gonna do, and he fills your ears and your soul with lies. Does God really love me? How much does he really love you in this moment? We get to respond in faith by going, he loves me as much as he loved me on the cross. With a perfect love, forgiving all of my sins and shortcomings and imperfections. Now, there's an interesting thing about the word comprehend. 
the Greek word comprehend, we, we tend to think of our minds, right? I want you to understand this, right? This does not mean that after church, I want you to be able to draw a cross on a piece of paper for me and go, see, I did it. The Greek word is katalambano, and what it means is to grasp or seize hold of. So Paul's not saying, I want you just to know information in your head of Jesus died on the cross. He says, I want you to take hold of it. I want you to grasp it. I want you to seize it with all of your might. Meaning, we never let go of the cross. We never forget the cross of Jesus. We never stop holding on to it as Christians. One of Luther's most famous teachings that we're sinners and saints all at the same time. Which means, on some days, you're going to be a really good Christian. You're going to do the things Jesus wants you to do. You're going to listen to the Holy Spirit when he convicts you and tells you to stop being a knucklehead. You're like, oh, okay, today I'm going to listen. Thanks, Lord. And then there's going to be days where you go, what Holy Spirit? Right? You know, God is going to talk to you. He's going to convict you. And you're going to not listen at all. That's called sinning. And you're going to be stubborn. You're going to be prideful about it. Why? Because you are a saint. You are forgiven and redeemed by Jesus. And how many of you realize without me telling you you're still a sinner? And we've figured that one out yet? It's not comfortable, but it's true. Right? If you want a good Bible study on this, read on your own sometime Romans chapter 7. Where Paul says, I know all the good things God wants me to do. I know the bad things he doesn't want me to do. And then he goes on and says, you know what I often do more than not? All the bad stuff. And that's St. Paul, the apostle. And then at the end of Romans 7, he goes, who's going to rescue me from this? Because how many of you have lived like Paul? Where you're like, I know the good thing that Jesus wants me to do. Right? Here, here's a few of my favorites that I never see in anybody's journal. I never see in anybody's house on their fridge or any plaques in their home when I visit. Love your enemies. You know who said that? Anybody know who said that? Louder. Jesus. Pray. Anybody know who said to pray? And then he also said, pray for your enemies, right? So how many of you are just out there every day looking for opportunities to pray good prayers, not that God would smite them, okay? That's not the prayer Jesus wants you to pray for your enemies. But how many of you go out, wake up tomorrow morning, Monday, it's the start of your week, and you're like, I am looking for opportunities to love the people that annoy me the most. Is that your wake-up call? Did anybody wake up doing that? You're like, I can't wait to hit the ground running on loving that person that drives me crazy and offends me and hurts me. Right? Nobody does that, but Jesus told you to do it more than once. It's one of his most common commands. And see, this is what Paul's getting at. He says, I know what Jesus wants me to do. I know what he's called me to do. And I don't always do it. And then he says, so what am I to do as this sinner and saint all at once? And at the end of Romans 7, he says, thanks be to God for Jesus Christ who saves a wretch like me. And this is what he's praying for you in Ephesians chapter 3, that you would comprehend, that you would see, that you would always hold on to the cross, that when you are having a great day and following Jesus, you would hold on to the cross and go, Jesus, thank you for your grace that empowers me. And then when you are having a really bad day and you are not loving your neighbor, you are not doing the things Jesus called you to do, and you are filled with all kinds of sin and guilt and shame, that you would cling to the cross and go, Jesus, thank you for your grace that forgives me and redeems me. What Paul is praying for you as Christians is that every single year, day of your life would be a day where you cling to the cross of Jesus. All right, and then he goes on at the end where he does something very important for us. Verse 20. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. So what he does is he concludes his prayer by praying for the church. He's praying that Jesus would be at work in the church. What that means practically is this, that when people would come to church, when they would encounter Jesus' followers, that they would go, this person in this place is different. Because Jesus is at work in this person, and Jesus is at work in this place. 
right, that the identifying mark of a church according to Jesus is that they would know they are Christians by their love. Jesus said that in the Gospel of John. And so Paul is praying for the church. He's saying, I want to see the power of God at work in the church through Christians so that when people look at Christians and they meet you on the street and they meet you at work and they meet you in your neighborhood, they go, that person's different. They think differently. They speak differently. They treat me differently. That they would, when they would come to a church, they go, this place is different because it's a place of grace and the love of Jesus for all people. Because how did he start the prayer? The father of what? All people. And so Paul concludes his prayer with this very practical thing of praying for the church, saying, I want you to be filled with the power of Jesus in your life. Which is another way of saying that when people meet you, they go, they're different than the rest of the world. This place is different than any other place on earth because it is filled with the power of Jesus. And then he says, amen. And the word amen in Hebrew, it's a Hebrew word, means true. Or the, let this be true. So what he's saying at the end is, let this thing that I just prayed be true in the church. That we would cling to the cross of Jesus in such a way that the power of Jesus would be at work in our lives and in our congregation. So that when people meet you, they go, they're different. There's something different about you. It's the power of Jesus at work in you. And that they would encounter our congregation and visit our congregation, they go, this place is a different place. It's a place of Jesus and his love and his grace. So here's my hope and prayer for you. Like Paul, I hope and pray that as a church, we would cling to the cross of Jesus every single day. That whether you're having a great day or a really bad day, really awesome time or a really difficult time, you would cling to the cross of Jesus and his perfect love for you. And that as a congregation collectively, we would be a place that is filled with the power of Jesus. So when people meet us, they go, this place is different. This is a place where I get to know about the love and grace of Jesus Christ for all people. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we give thanks for your grace and mercy that you have poured out to us perfectly through the cross and death of Jesus Christ, our Savior. May we cling to that truth and hold on to that truth every single day of our lives. And may it be so true and powerful at at work in our lives that we can't but help share it and show it to the world around us so that more and more people would know that you are their loving Father who loves them and forgives them through the cross of Jesus. In your name we pray, amen. This time I invite you to stand as we confess our Christian faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated for a moment before the prayers of the church. Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew promises to grow his church, to overcome the gates of hell with the gospel. So this morning, we're going to welcome a new member, Kimberly, if you would come forward. We're going to welcome Kimberly Sager into membership in our congregation. She's been worshiping with us for a long time as she's been going to college. She graduated and staying in KC, so she decided to stay with us. She's also blessed us by singing in the choir, so we're going to officially welcome her into membership as she's gone through our membership class. So I have some questions for her. I let her practice, and I gave her a sheet so she knows the answers. Beloved in the Lord, our Lord Jesus Christ said to his apostles, whoever confesses before me, uh, before men, I will also confess before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. Lift up your hearts, therefore, to the God of all grace and joyfully give answer to what I now ask you in the name of the Lord. Do you this day in the presence of God and of this congregation acknowledge the gifts that God gave you in your baptism? 
Do you renounce the devil and all his works and all his ways? Do you believe in God the Father Almighty, in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, and in the Holy Spirit? Do you hold all the prophetic and apostolic scriptures to be the inspired word of God and the doctrine of the evangelical Lutheran church drawn from them and confessed in the small catechism to be faithful and true? Do you intend to hear the word of God and receive the Lord's Supper faithfully? Do you intend to live according to the word of God and in faith, word and deed, to remain true to God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, even unto death? Do you intend to continue steadfast in this confession and church and to suffer all, even to death, rather than fall away from it? Do you desire to become a member of this congregation? Will you support the work our gracious Lord has given this congregation with your prayers and the gifts God has given you? Upon this year confession of faith, I acknowledge publicly that you are a member of the Evangelical Lutheran Church and of this congregation. Receive the Lord's Supper and participate with us in all the blessings of salvation that our Lord has given to his church. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right. Welcome Kimberly into our church membership. Okay, now you can stand back up for the prayers. I got a bunch of confused look when I told you to sit down. All right. Let us pray for the whole church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Heavenly Father, you have made us your own dear children through holy baptism. Strengthen us with power by your Holy Spirit in our inner being that your Son may dwell in our hearts through faith and that we would be rooted and grounded in love. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, you are able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think. Be glorified in your church and in Christ Jesus. Ground us in love. Give us a faith rooted in the promises of Christ and strength to comprehend with all the saints his love that surpasses all knowledge. Lord, in your mercy. Lord of might, spare us and future generations from wickedness. Give blessing to our nation and its leaders to rule according to your good pleasure. Protect the members of our armed forces and police and other public servants. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Heavenly Father, we, your people, cry out for your healing upon all those in need. Even as you sent your Son to heal and make whole, teach them ever to trust in your love, for you never leave nor forsake them. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, you name every family in heaven and on earth. We give thanks for our brothers and sisters in Christ who have finished their course in faith and now rest from their labors. Preserve us in the faith so that Christ may dwell in our hearts richly until the day that we join them around your throne. For the sake of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated as we continue our worship. I tie presenting our tithes and offerings to the Lord.
invite you to stand as we give thanks to God for all his gifts to us as we join together in singing hymn number 805. Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore, with angels and archangels, with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Blessed are you, Lord of heaven and earth, for you have had mercy on those whom you created and sent your only begotten Son into our flesh to bear our sin and be our Savior. With repentant joy, we receive the salvation accomplished for us by the all-availing sacrifice of his body and his blood on the cross. Gathered in the name and the remembrance of Jesus, we beg you, O Lord, to forgive, renew, and strengthen us with your word and spirit. Grant us faithfully to eat his body and drink his blood as he bids us do in his own testament. Gather us together, we pray, from the ends of the earth to celebrate with all the faithful the marriage feast of the Lamb in his kingdom, which has no end. Graciously receive our prayers, deliver and preserve us. To you alone, O Father, be all glory, honor, and worship with the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, in the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples, said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper. When he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
I invite you to stand and receive the communion blessing. This true body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, strengthen and preserve your faith to life everlasting. Go in his peace. Amen. We join together in singing, thank the Lord. We give thanks to you, almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift, and we implore you that of your mercy, you would strengthen us to the same in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Just one announcement. I want to give a th big thank you to Miss Donna, our LWL ladies, and other volunteers. Yesterday we hosted the Early Childhood Directors Conference where we had directors from all across the state here, and Miss Donna was the head of that committee. And we want to also thank all of the volunteers that helped her out to put that on. So if you give a round of applause to our congregation for that. As you depart today, go in the joy and the peace and the love of the Lord. May the Lord bless you and keep you. Lord, make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. Lord, look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Amen. Amen.